I'm Donna Hanover. From Marie Curie and Jonas Salk to researchers in space travel and telecommunications and underwater exploration, people with a passion for science have made significant differences in our everyday lives. Today we'll meet some fascinating people whose passion is bringing science into our lives in unusual ways. Science and You starts now. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. If you think pom-poms and scientists don't really go together, think again. You're about to meet the science cheerleaders. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover here at the Mysterious Bookshop. What does science have to do with a mystery writer? We're on the case, ahead on Science and You. I'm Barry Mitchell in Times Square. His father was a gambler and bookie who knew hustlers and prize fighters. He grew up to be a respected rocket scientist who knew Albert Einstein. We'll talk with Ronald Probstein about his memoir, Honest Sid, coming up on Science and You. I'm Lisa Beth Kovacs. I'm going to introduce you to a ninth grade dropout who found a second chance in science. Ahead on Science and You. Hi, I am Marlene Peralta. Coming up, we will meet the psychology professor who has created a safe haven for farm animals. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Let's talk about stereotypes. When you say scientists, some people might think over the top brainy. Talk about cheerleaders, they might think over the top bubbly. So what happens when you combine the two? You get the science cheerleaders determined to turn all that upside down. So this was the uniform I wore for a lot of my time, the little skirt. Right. And as little it is, look at that. <laughs> Meet Dr. Amanda Adelier, a former professional cheerleader who traded her pom-poms for a lab coat. Growing up, Amanda loved math and science. She also loved to dance and joined her school dance team. One thing led to another, and Amanda ended up as a professional cheerleader for the St. Louis Rams while she also attended college. How did you manage to keep all that together? Staying organized, which is something I think is really important for anybody in general and especially in the sciences. So I double majored in biology and in the classics, so basically Latin. And I just made sure I picked my courses in a way that, you know, if I could take the early morning class, I would do the early morning class and then be able to study in the afternoon, get everything done, go to practice and just, you know, keep everything in a very, on a very tight ship. When she isn't busy with patients at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center, Amanda spends some of her time as a science cheerleader. What, you might ask, is that? Exactly what it sounds like. The science cheerleaders are current and former professional cheerleaders who are pursuing careers in the sciences. Their mission is to inspire young women and encourage everyone to get educated about science. And they deliver that message with all the spunk you'd expect. The group is the brainchild of Darlene Cavalier, a former cheerleader for the Philadelphia 76ers, and a passionate advocate for getting the public engaged in science. Nothing is black and white. There is no easy answer to any issue we have. Stem cells, climate change, genetically engineered food, there are so many different thought processes that go into this. There's a sliver for you to add to that conversation. Are you essentially trying to get people, regular people like me, to sort of get in touch with their inner scientist? That is a great way to put it. Not everybody knows that they have an inner scientist. And some sometime in all of our lives, we had an inner scientist. It might have been when you were two years old. At some point, you're curious, you're a builder. I mean, there's a reason why kids love to build blocks and they ask a lot of questions. That is your inner scientist. And I don't know what we do to beat it out of kids, you know, and turn them off to science, um, but it's never too late. The other goal in this is to challenge the stereotypes people may have of scientists and cheerleaders. The combination is not as unlikely as some might believe. The science cheerleaders are made up of more than 200 professional cheerleaders, now in science and engineering. As Amanda explains, the skills she learned as a cheerleader have helped her become a doctor. 
One of the things I think that's subtle is when you're dancing, you have to be very aware of everybody around you. You're in a team and you're constantly being seen as a unit. You're not an individual. And I think in medicine, that's also critical. You are always working in a team. You and drawing little girls in with the glitter of pom-poms and sparkly uniforms can be a great opportunity to talk about careers in science, particularly those long considered male dominated. It changes, you know, sort of the way that they're thinking and it opens their mind. And I think that that's what's really great about science cheerleaders. And I suppose it shows them that, hey, you can be a cheerleader, but you can be a scientist too. Exactly. They're not mutually exclusive. These do not have to be separate lives, right? We can figure out a way to tie all of this and the teamwork and the optimism and all the great things here into science careers. A takeaway for all of us, the next time you're dazzled by cheerleaders during halftime, remember they may be just as amazing in a research lab. Oh, and don't be surprised if the scientist next door has pom-poms in her closet. I'm Carol Ann Rudell for Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. Just who is the mysterious alias behind the novels by Ada Madison and Margaret Grace? For a scientist or a sleuth, the answer is, of course, elementary. I'm Camille Minichino. I'm a teacher, a physicist, a laser physicist, a human factors engineer, a curriculum developer, a mystery writer. For all her occupations over the years, she's best known now as a mystery writer under various pen names. And her books are often set within the worlds of science and academia, with titles like The Hydrogen Murder, The Carbon Murder, The Square Root of Murder, and The Probability of Murder. Well, the ivory tower or academic mystery is, I, I, is experiencing a little uh, renaissance and becoming popular. And I think one of the reasons is that the ivory tower, just as it sounds, is supposed to be this wonderful, peaceful place with people walking around with lofty ideas, having conversations about philosophy and the Socratic method, and nothing bad really happens except maybe the food in the cafeteria isn't that great. So when you take that sort of idyllic setting of a school, a campus especially, beautiful campus, a tower, a bell tower, and then you look inside and you see all of this there's pettiness and things go wrong and people don't like each other and actually a murder. There's a saying people use that you should write what you know. Camille Minichino follows that adage. Having been immersed in the scientific community since the late 60s in everything from nuclear power and physics to lasers. Three Mile Island happened in uh, the late 70s. So immediately there was a huge rush in this country to look at all the nuclear power plants and see what was wrong with them or right with them. So I worked um, on control room design. I went to the laboratory in Livermore, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where I spent a number of years in high temperature physics. This time to melt heavy metal, I worked with one of the very few, or the very original uh, helium neon mixtures, a, you know, a gas laser. And now, of course, you can take peanut butter and get it to laze. So I've been really lucky to be able to see the whole history of lasers and to work with one of the early ones. That influence is proudly front and center in her novels, whether it's the puzzles in the back of the books or the scientific imagery in her prose. A love of writing and a love of science in a way I don't see them that different. So my metaphors tend to be based on physics and math as opposed to flowers and pets. Uh, so I would never say something like, uh, it, you know, being quiet as a mouse. I would say just as quiet as the inside of a vacuum tube. If you're going to be a scientist, you better know how to read and write also. If you're going to be a writer or a poet, you better know some science and math also. For Camille, they're all just different perspectives for understanding the world around us. One of the things I love to do is model making, and I do it in many ways. I do physics, I do fiction, and I make models. What it is, it helps us understand the universe. The universe behaves as if there were atoms. And it's the same with a, a novel. When we read a novel, uh, it's not real. We see it help, but it does help us understand real situations. But when we read the book, we gain an understanding of murder even when we're writing crime fiction, which is my main focus right now. We gain an understanding of what crime is like in the real world, 
how it affects people, including the detectives who try to solve it. But of all her talents, what gives her perhaps her biggest thrill is connecting with readers to make science fun and accessible. I wish I had someone, something like this when I was taking science or taking math. And that's my favorite reader. I'm not really sure what could be more fun than science. I lean toward math and science, the quantitative way of looking at the world. Um, and the rest of it, to me, is what makes the world beautiful. For Camille Minichino, science and literature have perfect chemistry. No mystery about that. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. I'm Barry Mitchell. Respected scientist Ronald Probstein grew up here in Times Square. But for him, his father and mother, it wasn't bright lights and glamour. Everybody else's father worked at a regular job brought home a regular amount of money. And my father was a, a gambler and a bookie. We're at the Cafe Edison on West 47th Street, an authentic vestige of 1930s era Times Square, to talk with Ronald Probstein about his memoir, Honest Sid. Dr. Probstein is Ford Professor of Science Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's written many scholarly works, but today, it's all in the family. Honest Sid was my father. He was liked by everyone in Times Square. When you're not living within the law, but just on the edge of it, it's better that you be honest, otherwise you wind up with broken legs. Sid was sure the racetrack would make him rich. He scalped tickets to Broadway shows. And when he gambled away the rent, he sneaked down the fire escape with his wife, Sally, and young Ronald. When you're a five-year-old kid, your mother drags you out in the middle of the night and drags you onto the fire escape. It's a little scary. Did you grow up and become a success because of or despite your upbringing? That's a very good question. Both my father and my mother, irrespective of what our situation was, were crazy about me. As bad as things were, they always tried to make sure that they, I was taken care of. And Stuyvesant High School took care of nurturing Ronald's love of math and science. And before that, he was inspired by a particular movie. The H.G. Wells, Things to Come. And that dealt with rocketry, going to the moon, building new cities in different planets. I don't even think I knew what being a scientist was. I just said, that's an awful lot of fun to do that. And now for the rule of the end, and a new life for mankind. What is ballistic missile reentry physics? Well, I worked on what was called hypersonic flow. That's the speed of flight or flow at many times the speed of sound. Incorporating principles of hypersonic flow in the design of missiles and spacecraft keeps them from disintegrating upon re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. I, with my colleague, more or less developed the theory of this flow. You wrote the book on synthetic fuels, isn't that true? That is true, yes. Among synthetic fuels, the most important, I believe, will be those that are made and derived from coal. That doesn't mean you're burning dirty coal. The fuels that you get and the process you use in making them can be very clean. The gases that are produced in them are easily captured. The fuel you'll get will be the same fuel that you pump out of your gas station right now. You knew, or at least you met, Albert Einstein. Tell us about that. Every person that I know that it goes into the physical sciences at one time or another becomes fascinated with relativity theory. And I was fascinated with it and I was reading his work and I saw another way of approaching a particular equation. This was an alternative and somewhat simpler approach to the same endpoint. Yours was E equals MC triangle. No, no, it, I don't, didn't tell you that. I, it wasn't that. And so I wrote it up and I went to his house in Princeton. Were you invited? No. You just showed up at his doorstep. Well, I had an, I told him that a friend of mine, who was a friend of his, uh, said I should go. He was a true gentleman, very, very nice, and he took it. 
And then he told me when to come back, and I came back again. He had looked at it, he said it was fine, very good, very pleasant to me. And those were my two times of meeting him. How much of your success did Honest Sid live to see? Oh, that was wonderful. He Just, took great pride in your accomplishments. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> it was embarrassing. I mean, sometimes he would exaggerate so much it was terrible. When we were going to get married in 1950, he told all the, the Damon Runyon characters in the Broadway scene here that Einstein was going to be at our wedding. <laughs> I loved him. I was crazy about him. Well, I realized that was his life and I had my life. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you, sir. Dr. Ronald Probstein, the book is Honest Sid, Memoir of a Gambling Man, available at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Thanks for coming down from Boston to speak with us. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome, <laughs> and you are watching Science and You. Hi, I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Life is not always a clear, straight shot to success, and there is no set path into science. I'm here today with Captain Mark D'Agostino, a U.S. Army Brigade surgeon. Captain D'Agostino dropped out of school after the ninth grade. But jump ahead to 2003, and that same dropout won a Marshall Scholarship. Since then, he's racked up a master's in biochemistry, a master's in health policy, and a doctor of medicine. So how does a kid who drops out in ninth grade become an internationally acclaimed scientist? It's definitely a long story, Elizabeth, but it's... Uh but it's, it's one that I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to really share with you. A day did not feel right um, unless I had started drinking and they even started to get, even started to feel a little ill, which I know now as a physician to be the kind of early delirium tremens. And that already had started by the time I was in the ninth grade. And it was a true dependency. D'Agostino left home at 14. One night, five years later, drunk on the street, he found himself alone in the Brighton section of Boston. Feeling the first fist, and then feeling the weird feeling of the, the of my teeth grinding to, together, and some of the blood in my mouth. And I remember the warmth down my neck where I'd been cut with the knife. And I remember trying to use my arms after a lot of this had happened, but I really couldn't. But I was so in, really at that point in time intoxicated to know that I had had they were shattered in my mind. I honestly had thought that. I was dying and that entire self-grieving process happened, but even more importantly was that I could see all the things that you hear about when you you know, your life flashes before your eyes. I could see my father. I could, I, I, to this day, I can hear his voice. And I realized that I really, the enormity, the gravity of what it is that we are, we're, we're, we're all immersed in, just, you know, and, and that I had so much potential, so many opportunities, and I threw it all away. And so I knew that at that time something really had to change because I really did feel like, a, like I got a second chance. I really had no, no business at that point as a, as a ninth grade dropout um, going into you know, really starting college. And, but you know, they, they gave me a chance. Um, my first semester, I got into a class. It was an upper level psychology class, but it was called Physiologic Psychology. It was with, with Dr. Tiffany Cunningham, and I don't even know how the heck they let this high school dropout who had no business taking that class, I don't even know how I got in t to that class. It just must have been an oversight, and I just ate it up. I just loved it, and Dr. Cunningham um, said to me, um, you know, I don't know what your major is, but you clearly have a propensity towards the sciences, and so um, once I went to the dictionary and looked up what propensity meant. I realized, I was like, well, thank you very much. And then, you know, a year later, I was there creating a sample cell and we were modeling heterogeneous tropospheric reactions on the 100 face of magnesium oxide crystals, making the, you know, and I was interpreting, uh, scanning, tunneling microscopy images. And I mean, the whole point is that it was just an extremely rapid acceleration because what I had been missing beforehand. What I had been missing when I was when I was when I was really young even was just that intellectual was just it's it's let me say this. I had the intellectual curiosity. I just didn't I just didn't know where to put it. And really and science and and chemistry and biology um, really
provided me the opportunity, and I was just off and running. I had tried to do everything that I could to pretty much hide my past, because I've got to be honest, I was, I was ashamed of it. And when I was even, when I was at UMass, I mean, at this point, I was in, in their honors program and at 4.0 and was doing everything, and I was doing research and presenting and had published paper. I mean, done all of these other things. I just, I told people I went to high school. I mean, I, I never, I just, to be honest, because I, I was just ashamed. Everyone blames others. Right? They'll blame the people, places, things. Oh, well, it's this town, it's this thing. No, it's, it's, it's you. You know, and once you make that decision, take that personal responsibility and realize that you're not in control. And I think that's so critically important is just acknowledging to yourself. You don't have to say it's anyone else. It's being honest with yourself. You're not in control. I honestly thought that I would be in jail or I would be dead. There was no planning. There was no thought about even finishing high school before. There was no fin college or, I mean, all these other sort of things that now that, I mean, I'm just immersed in this completely different world. Um, and I'm so grateful. And education and science in particular has been so important. And it's, it, it, is, it has fueled me and it's brought me to a point now where I really honestly feel like skies are the limit. And I want to I wanna share that. And I want other people to know that it's not too late. I am Marlene Peralta. We travel to upstate New York to meet psychology professor William Crane, who aside from teaching, takes care of rescue farm animals at his safe haven farm sanctuary. It's, it's really not good for us to be so isolated from the rest of nature. I, I think there's something really missing. My name is Bill Crane. I'm a professor of psychology at the City College of New York. Over the years, I found myself feeling more sympathy for the animals and I started to learn more, especially in the 90s, about the abusive conditions on factory farms and especially about how animals are treated and how they're crammed together and how they don't have a natural life. And I wanted to do something. And the idea of uh, a farm sanctuary appealed to me because we could rescue some of them, of the animals, and then have it open to visitors so they could see a little about what the animals are like. The study of animal behavior has led to attachment theory, how babies, human babies, get attached to their mothers. That is based on observations of animals. And I thought this would be a chance to really learn about animals. I've been interested in them and teach about them. So I thought if I taught about animal behavior out of books, it wouldn't be the same as if I knew something about animals. And so another motive was to get some firsthand experience and learn about animals. And one of the, the things I've tried to pursue is and get people to understand is that children need contact with the natural world. That's what produces, stimulates so much of their curiosity. And at the farm, I've been more and more impressed that it brings out another quality, which is their capacity to care for others. The animals, they spontaneously care about animals. They want to help them. First, they want to hug them, but then they want to take care of them, they, they worry You see about them, you see these nurturant feelings coming up. And I think most of us want children to grow up to be caring. As children become removed from the natural world, which is a crisis now really, uh, the, the fine qualities are diminished. I wrote a book, Reclaiming Childhood, and the central chapter is in there is called The Child as a Naturalist, and it, it, I try to draw out the benefits for the child. Uh, in, in having rich contact with the natural world. And one of the qualities that it, 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 nature stimulates their imagination, their creativity, their powers for patient observation. The children need time in the natural world and they need time to be around animals. And if they can do that, uh, their emotional health will benefit. In natural settings, there's a, a sense of peacefulness that comes over a child, a sense of calm, a sense of being part of something larger than
herself. I do feel kind of some degree of acknowledgement that they are gentle, comfortable around me. They seem to be peaceful in my presence because usually they're not. Usually they don't like humans, so you see them just relaxing. And uh, it's sort of an honor to me. It's a high honor. Like a lot of people would like to get praise from their peers or their colleagues or make a lot of money. To me, it's an honor to be accepted by these turkeys. It's, it would be good for children, it's good for all of us if we could get back to the natural world. For more information on the Safe Haven Farm Sanctuary, visit its website at safehavenfarmsanctuary.org. I am Marlene Peralta for Science and You. That's our show for today. I'm Donna Hanover. See you next time on Science and You.